Hello, I'm Marty Schaefer, Chief Distribution Officer at Ethos Life. We at Ethos Life are thrilled to be a sponsor of NALBA's Summer Symposium and the keynote speaker, retired Rear Admiral Paul Becker. It's an honor to introduce you, Rear Admiral. The Rear Admiral served 30 years as a Navy intelligence officer in peace, crisis, and combat. His assignments included Director of Intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the International Security Assistance Force Joint Command in Afghanistan, as well as leading the Presidential Transitions Intelligence Community Landing Team with policy input and strategic guidance to new administration cabinet secretaries. His unique combination of military, business, education, leadership, and medical patient experience combined to provide innovative insights into improving global risk management, along with organizational and personal performance. Innovative ways to improve the life insurance experience and process is the backbone of what we do here at Ethos Life. We take great pride in providing faster, better, and easier life insurance experience by offering same-day coverage with no medical exams and affordable policies. Ethos Life is breaking new ground in the life insurance market and are a proud sponsor to support the following presentation from retired Rear Admiral Paul Becker. Enjoy the meeting. Thank you, Ethos Life and Marty Schaefer for that nice introduction. I'm Paul Becker. I served for 30 years as a Naval Intelligence Officer around the world, afloat and ashore. My last three assignments in uniform were as the Director for Intelligence or the J-2 with the International Security Assistance Force Joint Command in Afghanistan, where we were focused on the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, the US Pacific Command in Hawaii, where we were focused on China and North Korea, and for the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon, where we focused on, well, the world. Uh, you'll notice there are only pictures for two of those three last assignments. That's because we couldn't find one where I was smiling at the Pentagon. And the picture where I'm in the full battle rattle at a security checkpoint at Kabul International Airport is with a Marine Reserve Sergeant whose full-time job is as an NYPD sergeant who knew my dad, a former NYPD officer, who always told the folks on his beats in the Bronx and in the Queens that he was part of their life insurance policy as well. So in my last role in the Pentagon, I was the principal threat advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for issues ranging from the cybersecurity to space to transnational to conventional to nuclear topics. It's an overused expression, but not in this case when I say there was never a dull day at the office. I've never been an independent life insurance agent and broker, so I can't tell you I know what the profession uh, is like a true insider. However, when I left the military several years ago, I did establish my own consultancy, and I'm familiar with starting up and maintaining a small independent business. And I can also assure you that I place a premium, no pun intended, on life insurance for me and my family. When I was in uniform as an intel officer, my principal task was to find out what the enemy didn't want us to know. In doing so, I often had to make sense of ambiguous indicators evaluate scenarios, and ultimately make recommendations to a combat commander to take a certain course of action, to mitigate risks to our forces. At the same time, I was responsible for developing plans to protect information that I didn't want the enemy to know about us. And these efforts fell under the banners of counterintelligence and cybersecurity. I believe there's application of all those skill sets to the insurance profession, making sense of data, balancing risk to provide a decision maker the best planning options, simultaneously protecting the client's personal identifiable information, plus defending your own and other business portals and gateways. So with that as background, I wanted to go a little deeper on cybersecurity and ensure you that the core of my remarks will neither be tech-centric nor compliance-heavy. In my experience, and I sense we've all experienced this over the past couple of years, those type of video broadcasts are a recipe for a snooze fest. So rather, 
my comments will focus on some best practices and human factors to keep your situational awareness high so that you may enact the best cybersecurity options for your brokerage general agencies. Hey, there's no doubt about it. Insurers, large and small, are on cyber attackers' radars, and attackers are getting away with it. Cyber criminals are caught at the most, according to the World Economic Forum, just 1% of the time, which is why independents like ourselves should not expect law enforcement to fix the problem. Cybercrime is a growing evil business model. It's not news that cyber threats are the top global risk for the financial sector in general. However, it is news that the frequency of incidents and the magnitude of their impact has increased. Leading the list of the most affected, according to a Bank of International Settlements 2021 study, are number one, payment institutions, number two, credit unions, and wait for it, number three, insurers. Insurers of all types are natural targets for cyber attackers because they possess substantial amounts of confidential policyholder data. Products, policies, and pricing, they're all powered by data. This is what makes it so valuable. With data, an insurance pro is able to offer the consumer just what they need at hopefully just the right price. More choice, lower costs are what makes consumers so ready to share their data. In contrast to other sectors, which hold mainly sensitive financial data, insurers typically also collect a large amount of protected personal and sensitive information and valuable unstructured data, such as emails, incident reports, and contracts. So what are the consequences? of a breach of your network. Well, the main consequences suffered by insurers following cyber incidents are business interruption and material costs, both for you, the business owner, the policyholders, plus third parties. Stolen data can be used for different criminal purposes, such as identity theft or to obtain financial gains, both for which you could be potentially liable. And besides, the direct financial consequence of business interruption, there may be severe, long-lasting, or even irreversible reputational damage to you. So insurers need not only manage cyber and IT risk with the company and the value chain, but they also need to keep pace with the threats and developments in the field. The field of cybersecurity as a whole tends to focus on technology. But there are a lot of people involved in cybersecurity as practitioners. So whether you're a company of one or you're a company of 10, I want to focus this conversation more towards that people aspect of cybersecurity. So I'll start with a question. Why can't we solve cybersecurity problems with technology alone? If you answered because there's a human dimension to cybersecurity, that's a bingo. Small business agent brokers may mistakenly think they fly under the cyber criminals' radars. But the Small Business Administration warns that these type of small businesses are attractive targets because they have information that is often not protected by the same security information as the bigs. Plus, small firms are more likely to flounder after a cyber breach because they typically have fewer resources to recover. And just because you're the founder, owner, president, CEO, or CFO of your own insurance business, you are not out of the criminal's field of fire. According to a Barracuda Network's 2021 report, hackers often target high-value accounts. For takeover of those type accounts of CEOs and CFOs are almost twice as likely to be taken because they have access uh, to high value accounts and are better for gathering intelligence or launching further attacks within an organization. So broadly speaking, any independent broker agent should consider five major security threat areas that their business must defend against. The first is computer hacks. According to a 2021 Hiscox report, Hiscox is a British Bermudan insurer 
About 15% of small businesses attacked in 2020 almost went under after being breached. That report also placed a direct cost of a cyber attack for small business at 25K. A Fundera report, a small business loan company, from the same time frame was more alarming. It highlighted that 60% of those attacked go out of business within six months of a breach, and small and medium business costs could run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this doesn't even include the indirect costs, loss of data, hours spent on recovery, loss of customers, litigation, and loss of reputation. If you don't have a virtual private network or a VPN already, I'd recommend looking into them for your business. They're fairly low cost. They're highly effective tools to help prevent hacks. The purpose of a business VPN is to provide end-to-end -end encryption for every device in your company's network, which means no snoops, no hackers, or even your internet service provider cannot see your location or data. This provides a private, secure connection to the internet, no matter where you are. They're practically useful, and when not physically in the office space, they allow you access to your own company's network over a secured, encrypted connection. Ransomware threats is number two. In its 2020 Internet Crimes Report, the FBI says ransomware threats increased 20%. From 2019 to 2020, about 2,500 total cases. At the same time, the total costs of attacks increased more than 200%, from 8.9 mil in 2019 to 29.1 mil in 2020. And not specifically mentioned here are the cousins of ransomware. And that's malware and viruses. Both of those are on the rise as well. My colleague, Bob Gorley, founder and the CTO of the cybersecurity firm OODA, or O-O-D-A, which stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act, estimates more than 80% of viruses, malware, and ransomware threats can be avoided by ensuring you have the most up-to-date patches on any system you're using. Number three is data leakage. Insecure external storage devices are the primary cause of data leakage. Occasionally, sending data to the wrong recipient and weak passwords also fall in this category. Any portable device can fall into the hands of unauthorized personnel. Theft is always a concern. My dad, the cop, had a rule of thumb. Never leave anything in your car that you can't afford to lose. This particularly applies to your computer carrying case when you're on the road. Number four, phishing scams. It's not just computer novices and the elderly who are vulnerable to phishing scams. Just ask insurance giants like Unum and Paul Revere Life, which recently had to pay state regulators 1.8 mil in penalties for cybersecurity violations. I'm aware of smaller penalties for other insurers in Virginia and Oregon as well. No doubt there are more examples. And number five, insider threats are negligent. Open computer screens in a public location, use of unprotected local Wi-Fi networks, passwords on sticky notes, bad, bad, bad. We have an expression in the Navy, small leaks sink big ships. You know, one of my favorite basketball coaches of all time was John Wooden of the UCLA Bruins in the 1960s to 70s. He emphasized flawless execution of the fundamentals when winning 10 NCAA championships. And on the first day of practice every year, even for returning upperclassmen and championship teams, all that was done at practice, number one, was putting on socks and lacing up sneakers to avoid unnecessary blisters and twisted ankles, and then dribbling and passing to maintain possession, and then running and running to build up stamina. No shots were taken. The fundamentals. Basic computer and password hygiene are fundamental. So it's my experience that many small businesses fall into the trap of assuming that cybersecurity challenges are caused solely by technology shortfalls. 
While it's undoubtedly critical to have the right tools in place, too many overlook human factors that they ought to consider. A large amount of security incidents, 40% by conservative estimates, are caused by human behavior, such as susceptibility to phishing, negligence, or insider threats. Companies could have all the tools in the world at their disposal, but if the root cause is driven by human actions that aren't practiced and protected, well, then the business remains vulnerable to a breach. So what are the critical human factors in cybersecurity? I'll limit it to just three. Number one, prioritization. There's a lot of things we do as small business owners, but what is most important to your insurance business is the question. It's impossible to have multiple number one priorities. It's my opinion that artificial intelligence or AI and machine learning, ML, they can't get you over the hump when it comes to making a number one, number two, number three business priority determination. That comes from your reflection. And if others are involved, communication and collaboration by incorporating their diverse professional opinions as well. In my case, my best collaborator is my wife, Kim, whose comments on my prioritization sometimes ranges from, what, are you nuts? To, uh, yeah, that makes sense. But we also need to think about fill in the blank. Number two is investment. Cybersecurity is an investment. It is not a cost. It's C-suite level business even if you are your own C-suite. The answer isn't throwing money at new tech, but investment could be taking time to research and understand the cyber terrain of this business space so you can train with the best tools that meet your budget. At a minimum, read cybersecurity companies' threat reports. Many are available at no or low cost online. Training. The most successful organizational teams I know all had or have a plan for when the poo hits the fan. Recent headlines underscore the importance of small business owners having a written security plan to protect the privacy of their clients' personal information. Not only could a breach of clients' personal information devastate an independent insurer agent broker's reputation, it's likely to result in their agency having to undertake some time-consuming and costly actions on behalf of clients whose PII was compromised. Plus, now there's the very real possibility of incurring a fine. So just as a well-managed agency takes specific steps to protect against errors and oversight risks, it needs to have a security plan and a cybersecurity incident response plan in writing. It's not hard to put a pen to paper or fingers to a keyboard to come up with a one or two pager. It's not that different from the business plan that many of us had to write to get our own companies or LLCs started. And of course, the security plan must be aligned with the business plan. Then, once a month or so, tabletop wargame it. See, I figured I needed to use a military phrase like war in there somehow as a former officer, but I didn't want to use a trite reference to Sun Tzu. So tabletop war game was it. Simulate a breach of your network. Script a scenario, a different one every time based on what you hear or read about what is occurring in the business space. Devote dedicated time for yourself or others in a room and play it out to completion. Hopefully you'll never have to exercise it. But if you do, I guarantee a significant return on this time investment. So now, the two words you've been waiting to hear. In conclusion, and there's a bunch of recap lines in case you missed some key points along the way. For many small businesses, dealing with cybersecurity can feel like an unfair fight. After all, if large organizations like Target and Sony and Verizon and heck, even our own government's Office of Program and Management can be accessed and can't keep the big guys out. How can an independent agent broker keep them out? As unachievable as it may seem, there are some simple steps that we as small business owners can take 
to reduce our own cybersecurity risks. I'll start with a cybersecurity framework. Now, frameworks provide a map, a blueprint for building a cybersecurity program that manages the risk to data and reduces the vulnerabilities to a business. If you need a place to start, look at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. The acronym is NIST. The Cybersecurity Framework, CSF. Together, they go by NIST CSF. The NIST CSF is the gold standard amongst the cybersecurity framework professionals, both nationally and internationally. The best defense is a good offense when it comes to cybersecurity, and that's why frameworks can be so helpful. The important thing to remember is that cybersecurity is not just a technology issue, as I've already mentioned. It's a human factors issue. So there are five core components to the NIST CSF framework. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. A quick touch base on each of those five. Identify. Where do you stand now? The first step in any cybersecurity strategy is to assess where you are today. Conduct a risk assessment of your business's IT environment. A risk assessment should include asset management, outline the business environment you're operating in, any governance that you must meet, like HIPAA regulations, a risk management strategy, and a supply chain risk management strategy. Identify current vulnerabilities and develop an action plan of what your organization needs to fix. It's critical to determine how much risk that your organization can tolerate in the event of a breach. Talk to your own business insurer carrier about whether a cybersecurity policy covers all the possible breaches. Number two is protect. How do you continually protect your business from cybersecurity threats? Well, protecting includes identifying access control points, both physical and online, awareness and training, data security, information processes and procedures, up-to-date maintenance patches, and utilizing the right technology to protect your organization such as VPNs or virtual private networks. Detect is number three. Continuously monitor your network. Detection is key to identifying potential breaches. A comprehensive detection program should include notifications of anomalies and events. In addition to protecting an organization's firewalls and switches and servers, endpoints need to be monitored with security information and event management tools. So what's an endpoint? Well, it could be a desktop, a laptop, a, a smartphone, a tablet, a server, a workstation with a remote connection to the network. Each endpoint creates a potential entry point for security threats. Now, many VPN network providers offer this type of service. Take advantage of it. Next is respond. How will you respond in the event of a cybersecurity breach? Tabletop war game it. This should include a communications plan to all your stakeholders, notifying them of the incident, an analysis of the event, mitigation of future events, and what improvements can be made to prevent incidents in the future. And finally, recover. How will you bounce back from a cybersecurity incident? Once an incident's been stopped, it's important to have a post-incident meeting. In naval aviation, it's called the post-flight debrief. And in the Army and the Marine infantry, it's called the after-action review. You go over what happened. How did it happen? When did it happen? The steps that need to be taken to address the breach. What changes need to be made in policy and procedures? How do we improve our education and awareness? What tech changes or additions need to be made to reduce the probability of future breaches? Look, implementing a cybersecurity framework for a small business can seem daunting with all the other priorities that exist for independents like us. But like David and Goliath, it can feel like we small business owners are weak compared to the cyber threats out there. 
But keep in mind, doing something, like even David throwing a rock against Goliath, it'll benefit your organization more than doing nothing at all. Take small steps that enable you to implement a cybersecurity framework one stride at a time. Hey, fellow small business owners, the goal of all these efforts is increased performance, productivity, and profit. I've seen it work. I'm confident of your success with applying these human factors and best practices that fit your independent brokerage general agencies. So finally, as we say in the Navy, fair winds and following seas. Thank you.